Welcome, one and all, to another episode of Drink While You Think. I'm one of your hosts, Kenji, and that guy right there is... I'm Matthew. Matthew, who's our sponsor today? We don't have a sponsor right now. It's really sad. We're hoping that somebody somebody needs to send us beer, um, and uh, then they'll be our sponsor. If I send beer to you, can I be the sponsor? You can. Okay, I'll do that. I'll send beer to you. I think you're going to be the sponsor. I heard I heard the uh, porter is almost brewed. Is that true? It is. I'm giving that about another week or so, and it should be ready for testing. So oh, that's, I might volunteer for testing on that one. I, I figured you would. Um, what, do you, what are you drinking today, man? I'm drinking today. This is the Tavoli Brewing Company. This is their... Mountain Squeeze Juicy IPA. And can you, I don't know if you can see that. Look at the date of the brewery, 1859. Well, I'm like, hoping that's not their born on date. So geez, I that either. It's, um, it's a Colorado brewery. Apparently it's Colorado's oldest brewery. Oh, it foamed up on me, making a mess on the desk. I'm spilling beer. We're already having problems. Um, it's the oldest brewery in Colorado. They've got a it's kind of cool too because they've got a um, a program with the university where it's like a co-op almost. Like so, you can get a brewing degree. Why did I know about this? And you can go to like Metro State University, and you get like an internship with these guys at Tavoli, and you get to brew beer as part of a college degree. I'm going back to school. Then I'm going to pull the Rodney Dangerfield and go back to school and do that. Also, I'll say real quick before I want to hear yours is um, I had to look it up. I'm like, 1859 is like that legit. Like, and I look back at the history of it. It looks like it changed hands a few times and shut down for about 15 years. And, you know, but they're still in the same facility they were that's been upgraded a few times. So you just got to market things, right? right? It's the marketing kind of, I guess so. What are you drinking? I'm going with closer to home. Three taverns. Mm. Slay the psycho nut. Uh, it's an eight percenter. Uh, so we got a, a pretty hefty beer here. Um, it's um it's a coffee milk stout. So we'll we'll see um, like see how how it goes here. So I had yeah, these at the tailgate the other day. So oh, yeah, it looks like I, up your, that looks your style for sure. Yeah, cheers, man. Cheers, dude. Hazy IPA that I'm doing. Pretty good so far. Good color, all that. Okay. okay. This one has a, a really strong almond flavor. I thought the coconut, but it's like the almond. is is chocolate almond and coconut. So the al- almond's a little bit overpowering. It's interesting. Wow. Okay. Really coming through today. Okay, interesting. So um, I thought... I mentioned, you know, you got to brand things and market things and 1859, oldest brewery. I want to talk sales and marketing today, partly because the beer made me think of it, but also we were just at a conference. We were just in Nashville, uh, kind of at a conference, kind of doing our partner retreat. We thought we were going to do some drinking while thinking from our retreat, which we've done in the past, but we were too busy having fun running around in Nashville. Um, but an interesting thing happened that's happened to us before. And this was the question kind of came up amongst some other accountants and accounting firms about sales and marketing and kind of what does acuity do? And without giving it all away, what was the basic like punchline? Like what, what happened? Like when that came up in front of you, like, Oh, tell us about yours. Like you just had to kind of, well, I mean, I mean, it's a complicated question I've found, and I think you've been put in a situation if you're if you're in a group of people that have like a 15 person firm or less, right? Where they're doing the sales and marketing. So when you, when when they're asking the question like, "What should we do for sales and marketing?" They're talking about what should I do, right? Yeah. In sales and marketing, like what what can I change, you know, in that 15 percent of my time or 10 percent of my time that I spend on sales and marketing. So when we get that question, I think both of you and I 
have found, and I think you've actually even been asked to just not speak about what we do. And like by, by a panel arranger uh, sometimes. So I, I, I found it's, myself yeah. in that situation this time. Like they didn't, nobody asked me not to, but I didn't feel like my perspective would be productive for a smaller firm. Yeah. And so I think that's kind of the teaser for us is we're basically get told at times, don't even bother talking about your sales and marketing because it's just, it's too out there. It's just too different. But I thought we'd dig into it a little bit, maybe try to break it down a bit and, and hopefully help some other firms out there like today that some friends who are watching other firms who are doing it. Sure. So I've got, a, I've got a series of some questions. Okay. Let's start with the first question. In one word, how would you describe Acuity's sales and marketing function? Volume. Volume. Ooh, good word. Good word. Volume. Yeah. Um, the word that came to so my mind to... was mine was experimental. Like experimentation yeah. was the one. But I like yours. So let's let's dig into yours a little bit. Well, if you're talking like our sales representatives have to make about 300 reach outs to reach out to 300 different people to get one client. Right. So from a, it's just a, a volume play, right? Yep. Yep. So for those of you out there, like we did, we looked away from accounting firms when we built our sales team. So we looked at what SaaS companies do, like software companies do, and they have this process where they identify uh, you can call it a niche or um, they call it frequently an ideal client profile. So they go through the process of saying, okay, um, I would like to reach out only to people that have a 10 person company that are in the technology field that have less than 10, well, less than 10 employees. Ideally, if we can find some metric, they have between 250 K and a million in revenue. And you start really getting it narrow at what you're reaching out to, like who you're reaching out to. And then you reach out to all those people, <laughs> you know, and you, and you try and they, their only goal is to set an appointment for somebody that closes it. You know, we're lucky enough and fortunate enough to have a closer. That's not one of us. Right. So I think a lot of the firms are not in that situation. So that's kind of different, but so we have separate people that all they do, we call sales development reps. All they do is seek out people that fit our customer profile send them emails, push them to our website, whatever it takes, and then uh, try to set appointments if they get a hold of them for our closer, who we call an account executive. So, and then our account executive does what you would normally think, right? He runs a, an hour long first meeting. He, he, if there's follow-up and he needs to bring in an accounting resource to get more technical, or if there's something he can answer, he sets a second meeting. If there's not a second meeting, he actually gets to a price quote. He sends the price quote, you know, he'll either set a follow-up meeting or do a video review of the price quote, and then people have to make a decision, right? So I don't know if that's the, the, the summary, but like, it's all about numbers, right? It's all about, and if we can get the numbers from, if you do a hundred reach outs, you get a client, it's way different than when you do 300, you can get one client, right? So like the, the math just kind of compounds on itself. So how are your dogs doing today? Dogs are doing great. Can you hear them barking in the pack? You can hear them barking? A little bit, a little bit, not too bad. Uh, a little bit. Because um, that's way outside. I'm surprised you can hear it. I got my earphones in, so I, I couldn't hear it. Um, I, I think it's, that reminds me of, of a quote or a thought process by kind of a business writer. I like Jim Collins, who wrote Good to Great, and he talks about um, firing bullets and then cannonballs, right? To where, and this maybe gets a little bit into my, maybe almost a combined of our two words, experimentation and volume. Like you're, you're, you're making small adjustments, you're firing small bullets, pinging. And then when you get on something, you're firing cannonballs, you're firing the big, taking the big shots, the big numbers, the big volume through, right? You find something, but it is important. I think people think about, again, it throws people off um, when they think about the, the pure volume, the number of no's you get, or right, or non-responses you get. So um, let me ask you this, and let's kind of keep moving through this. Um, 
I was going to ask, you kind of identified it like what, how this differs from most traditional CPA firms. We kind of talked about that a little bit, but I mean, I guess you were in a business development role when you were in public, right? But did you have, yeah. you didn't have any form of this well, type of outbound, right? No, no, no. I mean, I mean, there was one guy from Wyatt that, that they were testing out some telemarketing, they called it, but, but they weren't, they weren't targeting things. They weren't, I mean, they, they weren't running. So when we target somebody, we'll, we'll send five emails and make three phone calls for every person we target. Right. So like, that's different than, you know, getting a, a phone call here or there, you know, from a telemarketing support. I mean, the difference between the accounting firm model like that I was running in, um, in, in a bigger firm was I was the closer, right? So it was a relationship sale. You're trying to, to get a big audit, like it's a $35,000 decision or a $60,000 decision or $120,000 decision for an audit. You're trying to get referred in. It's a different kind of sales process because you're trying to get people that know that person to especially the bigger you get, once you start getting over 50 or 60 K, you started needing people to, to, we, we call it the good word, like put a good word in for you, right. Uh, on the side, um, you know, where you'd have people that knew the person either by scouting them on LinkedIn or somewhere else through the organization and you could network out a, an organization. I mean, for the stuff that we're selling in the average, I mean, our average customer spends, you know, 1100 bucks a month. So you're talking about 13 K a year, you know, like there's no real relationship mapping. You're not trying to, like, if you get a referral, that's a great advantage, but it's not like a, it's not a decision point for people. So just completely different kind of perspective, but you know, to, to not have the line accounting people do sales is, is such a more efficient model from a, making sure we're focusing on the right kind of clients perspective, uh, from an alignment perspective, from a highest and best use of your time perspective. It's just a great, I think, great structure. I much prefer it. There's very few accountants I used to work with or have worked with since that really enjoy doing sales. Like they like talking to people, but they hate doing sales. It's totally different. Like, yes, they're good at it probably, but they don't enjoy like the volume that you would have to do to build a company, right? Yeah. Um, I'm going to let you take a drink. And also in that, I'm going to also ask you to clean your screen off. I think you were so excited. Like you, I think you, like you did something on your camera. Like you, you spit on the camera. You spit beer on it. There you go. Um, while you're fixing things and drinking, you were so excited. No. Um, our next question, I'm going to answer it first because you never answer. Uh, you never ask me questions, so I'm going to ask this one and answer it. But then you you're going to ask question. yourself the question. Yeah. Why don't you tell me the question and then I'll ask you. What's no. the question? No. Um, the hardest thing about running a sales marketing process like this, Kenji. What What would you say the hardest thing about running a sales marketing process like this? I don't is? want to answer that. No, I'm kidding. Um, it's It's the nose. Like for me, it's the it's, it's, it's the math side of it where you get a lot of people who don't respond. You get, you get some people who are just pissed, who get angry, who are like, how dare you reach out to me? You know, and that is an uncomfortable place for most people. It's particularly uncomfortable for accountants. I think it's just a, you know, we're used to being the trusted advisor and you're used to being kind of reserved, right? And conservative. So being a bit aggressive and getting people to kind of slap you down and say, no, go away. Like, don't, how dare you show up in my inbox? How dare you leave me a voicemail, right? Is, um, is something I think that is hard. I, it gets, I will say this, it gets easier, a lot easier, but I think initially it just is, it's, it is a little bit gut-wrenching. And I think people have to kind of understand that. So I think that's difficult. What, what about you? What do you think is, difficult about most difficult about this process i i mean this would be a personal thing i'm not a micromanager right and so if you have somebody running sales and marketing they need to really be a numbers person 
A, B testing, what's working, what's not working, making more frequent changes. Um, I think our sales and marketing team could really benefit from somebody like that, kind of looking at the 50,000 foot view and keeping a, an eye on the numbers, how marketing interacts with sales um, more beneficially. So that's the most challenging part to me. It's very analytical and I'm very much a gut feel kind of manager <laughs> rather than uh, like, I don't enjoy pulling up a dashboard every day and seeing what's going on. And I think that's what's really required in a, in a really efficient sales organization. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's tough. There's a number of things that are tough about it. Um, I think those are, th that's one actually, but if you think about it, most accountants, I think you'd be surprised because this methodology of sales and marketing, using it, it is so analytically numbers driven. It's not very relational, right? Right. So and I know when people, I think sometimes feel like a salesperson has to be, oh, this huge Rolodex, they're out and just talking to everybody. That's not what this process looks like at all. In fact, it's very analytical, lots of testing. And so that part of it may be attractive to many accountants. Just, just know that the numbers are going to show that like you get a very low percentage of hit rate on it. Um, but some people, again, um, you got to stay on those numbers on a regular basis. Whoever's running it has to be very focused on it. So in fact, account accountants may be better at running this than they think. And so I'd say as a, if you were thinking about hiring someone to come in to do this, don't discount looking for someone on your team or someone kind of young, kind of in the profession, who's pretty good with staying on top of numbers and don't err on just a, a oh, let me find the most relational person I can, I, I can think of. Cause that's not exactly how that process works. At least when we've done it. So, okay. Um, should you made a point at the top of the podcast about, Hey, this is kind of what we do at our size. Now at a smaller firm and you're, 15 or so, like you mentioned, like, hey, it may not make sense. Do you think an outbound, we've been kind of talking about outbound sales, I guess we've migrated the conversation to, is that something that should you should try at any size? Or is that, do you think that's later stage or or no, it should be experimented anyway? Regardless I, I, think, I, I think anybody who's serious about growing their firm should consider it because it, it, it forces you into some decisions. Um, and, well, it does a couple of things naturally. It, it, it makes the decision of whether to use your firm or not, not about you personally. So I think when people that own the firm are selling, like that client is tied to you. And I think you have a mental block over that. And if that's the case, you can only serve so many clients. If you have a sales and outbound sales team that does not include you, right? You are taken out of that equation. You can be a component to that. You can have, we have people like Matthew here. You could say that, right? But you're not the reason why people are picking your service. They're picking it for the service itself, right? And that frees you up, I think, more mentally <laughs> to, to grow than anything, right? It forces you to, to decide you know, to admit that you're just not that important to that process or to acquiring that client, which is, I mean, a lot of us have some pretty big egos. I think that was the hardest thing for me to get over when we started. Mm -hmm. Like, who's going to buy this if I'm not here, like yeah. doing it, the guy doing the stuff and I'm not the, the partner on the account and stuff like that. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I agree with you. I think those are great points, reasons why it should Everyone should consider this if you're going to be a growth-minded firm, which I think all firms should be growth-minded. Um, I, I also like it for the reason of, I think it builds an interesting muscle for you as a firm. I think it does the same thing for someone going into that role. You mentioned the SDR role. It's a tough role. Like it's a grind. It's a, it's a tough role. It's a grind. And we, we came to the, you know, the recognition that it's a it's probably a couple of years if that person needs to be moving into something more. It's like you wouldn't want to be a staff accountant. Most people wouldn't in a public accounting firm for life. You're trying to grow and go. But there's some things that are important to learn. I think the learning 
organizationally, the learning as a team member, an individual is, it just gives you grit. It gives you resilience. Um, you got to work those numbers. You got to get a lot of no's. People used to talk about um, having early jobs in door-to-door -door sales, like light, you get that door slammed on you. And, or sometimes people talk about working in client service, like, hey, you, you have to work in a restaurant or hospitality at some point just to deal with different personalities. And I think there's something to that with this sales model where it just does build a little bit of grit to you for you. And like, hey, we're going to try things out. We're going to get a lot of no's, but we're not really going to be afraid. And it kind of builds a bit of that muscle of like a little toughness to you. I'm like, okay, well, that didn't work out so well, but like, hey, it's, you kind of keep going, you keep pushing through. I think as a young person going into sales, if you're interested in sales or business development, whatever it might be, I would encourage people coming out of school to look at how prospecting works, right? The sales development role. So, um, and you can do this without with part-time people. There's lots of ways for firms of all sizes to try this out, but it's a good way too to run experiments. So I, 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 th I do think it's something that most firms should, should really consider. It's not something just for a, a larger firm like us or even a moderate size one. I think you should be thinking about it this way because otherwise you're really limited to growing. It's just as fast as, as fast as you can based on your personal relationship network, right? And that's not, that may not be fast enough for most people. And that's, that may not right. be enough growth. So, um, all right. Uh, what? Okay. We're going to assume, and I think in this day and age, everybody, every firm has a website. Please. Everybody has a website. Yep. Please tell me they do. Um, what is the next thing you should spend on? What's what's dollar one spent on after at least there's a web presence? What would you do? I mean, how, what would you do? I hate marketing. I just don't understand it at all. Um, said from the person running marketing and sales at our at our team. No. Um, you know, I don't know. It's tricky, and I don't. I don't know if I know either. I don't, I don't know. Um, you know, every I I always joke. I call marketing eating our vegetables. Everybody tells us it's good for it. We just don't know why, so we just eat the vegetables. Um, so I I think likely um, putting some valuable content out on uh, a blog um, is at least once a week. Um, for a period of time, you know, um, at least once a week, putting out new content on a blog. And um, if you are running a plugin on, on WordPress, like Yoast or something like that, where you at least you, you write the blog, something that makes sense, that's helpful to people that addresses a need that, that your target client might be interested in. Just something you know about. I, I really encourage people to do it. Just whatever came up that week with another client and then turning it into a blog and then going through um, a plugin in your website and making sure because they you, you run it through and it gives you a score and, and you go until most things are green. It's pretty simple um, on kind of keywords and stuff like that and figure out like what, what is the important word. I think that would probably be number one. I think um, at the end of the day, um, you know, you can try to game the system and try to do whatever you want to do, but Google is getting smarter and good, solid content is rewarded or will be re rewarded long-term. Now you have to do other stuff like republish and refresh these things, you know, once every two or three years uh, or stuff like that, which is a process we're kind of doing now. So we we ate our vegetables for the first, I would say five years. So we have 400 blogs now and we're going back through and doing taking anything older than three years combining similar topics and making longer form blogs. So it used to be that 300 word blogs were in vogue. Now people want to read 1500 words. So now we're combining them. Like our goal right now at Acuity is to have 150 quality blogs from 400. So we're actually trying to have better longer form content. But if you're just starting out, I would just say, take today's problem you dealt with with your client or this week's coolest problem make it generic, 
put it on the blog, run it through an SEO tool, and then um, post it. Just put yourself out there. I think um, people like people who are helpful. Um, I, I mean, I I think paid's a whole other world that you just don't want to. That's just definitely not the first damn thing you do because uh, you got to have a website that's converting and tells a story because paid just gets people to your website. So it's a, it's a, it's a whole other beast that we we're, we're not, we're still not optimized for right now. No, if you're going to do paid, you have to be so on top of measurements, right. Of it, because I was going to say that, um, yeah, I don't think I do paid either, but I would say, I think this is consistent with what you talked about with content is you spent the time, you built the website, you've got to push people to the website. You have to, you have to get people on the website. It is the modern day brochure. It is your neon sign. It is whatever it is. It tells your freaking story. And you and I have had a very strong proclivity to it. We think actually that tells the story the most is like, probably your pricing page. I, I, I think get that pricing page compelling. Everyone does accounting services, whatever. Show how you price for what you do. I think that's a huge thing. And so focus on, it probably is more refinement of the website measurements. So spending around that because you've got to get people there. And, and if you just build a website and you do SEO to get people there and you think it's going to convert, it's not going to convert. You have to run lots and lots of tests, but um, you're also not done. You go build a pretty website and you probably put up on LinkedIn somewhere like, hey, come and look at Acuity's new pretty website. Okay, great. You're going to get a few hits on that for a couple of days, maybe. And then it's done. You've got to do, and, and content is the best way to push people there. I think blog posts, blogs are good. There's a lot of people working with video these days. Whatever it takes to push people back to your website is is where I would go next. And then spending a little bit on tools so that you can understand what's happening on the site. Oh, they're going to this page. Oh, they're not. They're getting stuck here. Wow, like this blog post is getting a lot of traction. Some of those are not even things you have to spend on. But if you're not comfortable with that, get someone to help you spend a little bit on that and figure out where they're going because it's just like, what's the point of having a website if nobody goes to it? If nobody goes yeah. there, it just makes zero sense. So, um, yeah, yeah, we still have that one blog I wrote in 2012. That's our top blog ever of all time. It's about guaranteed payments versus draws, and we didn't even do taxes at the time. No, it just had come up with a client, so I wrote it down. And then over the years, every three or four years, we make something prettier for that thing. We put some charts on it. Then we. So added a call to action. And here's a bonus for anybody who's hung out this long who won't. There won't be anybody who listens this long. I think the best thing you could do is build a tool, build a calculator. We've seen this before, whether it's in Google, oh, yeah. Google Sheets, do something, give some value. Like, hey, we did this. Here's our free PPP worksheet calculator, right? Oh my we gosh. People flooded to that. We had, we had, we were like hundreds or thousands, like hundreds a day to the website. Okay. We had 150 downloads a day for that for a while for the PPC, PPP calculator. Yeah. If you it's have crazy. any kind of tool you can give away for Just free. do that. It's un, yeah. That's unbelievable. I mean, I remember looking up at that because we, all we did was we linked to a Google sheet. And that Google sheet, you look up in the corner about who was on it. And like, there's just like this huge, like hundred plus people in a Google sheet. You're like- At a oh time. My, at a yeah. time, at a time. It's crazy. So I, I would spend some time thinking about what you can give away that has some value. Um, there's my bonus for people who stood around this long. Um, last question before we start rating the beers. Um, we've been doing this, I think around seven or eight years. We've been kind of playing around with this. What do you think is the single thing that's changed the most in that time frame? From what we've, what do we change the most in the way that we approach sales and marketing since we started? I mean, we didn't have the sales team eight years ago. I mean, we were just building it. But um, yeah, yeah. what have we changed the most? I think. Or what's um, maybe what's maybe changed the most? I think what's changing the most right now is video. 
and video and mobile. Um, we're about to have to be like our buyers are about to be mobile buyers in the next 10 years, um, maybe the next five years. So I think the biggest thing we've changed is that people are probably looking at their our website from their phones or is about to change, I think is a more important thing is we're having to start getting ready for that, um, which is a different than a desktop experience. And we're just going to have to be mindful of that on the website side um, from the just... I mean, that's what do you think? Because uh, I mean, I, I, there's, I think, all, there's so much has changed, like just from cloud perspective in the last. I, I, I think the numbers have gotten even harder on nobody. Nobody, very few people respond over email or answer the phone, right? So people think that's a failure. Oh, the model of outbound doesn't work. That's not true. It's just people are so used to it, right? No one, I mean, you, you're still a little bit of an odd duck, but you were the one person for a long time I knew, like, you'd answer every phone call. But even you don't do that anymore. Like, nobody does that because it's just, everybody knows when a spam call is coming through or just labeled as spam or it's unknown, nobody answers them. So you don't get anybody offhand who goes, oh, that's funny, you happened to call. I was looking for bookkeeping or tax service. That never happened. So everyone's wise to that. But- that still puts them into your funnel. It's still, you can still have an interaction with them. I think people are probably more in some ways okay with it. Like, yeah, I'm just kind of used to it. And then if they end up coming back to it later on, that's fine. So I think those numbers and conversion rates have gone down, I would say. Uh, but I agree with you on video. And I also think you and I very much believe this, that it's going to come up soon to where people do want to buy online right there without talking to a salesperson. That yeah. is not quite there yet. It's getting close, but it is completely logical to me that people are going to want to buy anything and everything exactly like they buy things on Amazon. That's what we're closest to understanding. That's what we all prefer is the Jeff Bezos company of Amazon, you know, all that. That's how we want to buy. We've been conditioned to buy that way. So our experience is we want to buy that. We want to go there and go, what are, what are rankings of this? And then what have other people said about acuity services? How do I make it easy to purchase in one click? How do I get it delivered to me quickly? How can I return it easy if I need to? That, that's, that's coming. That's just how people prefer to buy things these days. And I think that's, that's going to change. Well, yeah. And the, if you look at the last 12 months, the biggest change that we've seen is that two thirds of the people now schedule first appointments online versus through our sales reps. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. even if they originated with our sales rep sending them an email, they don't want to talk to, they don't want to go back and forth on the email trying to schedule a time. They want to go to our website, pick the time that works for them and then talk to, as we say, talk to Tyler, because that's our yeah. sales guy, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think, I think you're on point there. So. Okay. If you haven't, yeah, if you haven't checked out Calendly, we integrated with their website. That's how we do all our first appointments. Now it's really kind of great. So use shout out to an Atlanta company. Use Calendly, not Acuity. Acuity used for accounting, just don't use them for scheduling, not Acuity scheduling. Sorry, Acuity yeah. scheduling. We prefer Calendly. But we um, like we like a Calendly guys. Those they, they they were in the office with us before. So they're our, they're, our, they're our friends. So okay, I'm gonna rate mine. Uh, it's a juicy IPA. I was going to give it a little bit of a lower score, like a three, two, five. It's okay. These types of beers, you got to drink pretty fresh. And I, since I got it like in a, almost like in a subscription service, they don't, they don't tell when the born on date was. I hope it wasn't 1869, but it just feels like it needs a little bit more. Fun. I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to give it the benefit of a three, five. Yep. I, I think it's just, it just, I, I didn't get it as fresh as it could be. Um, oh no, now it's, and now I'm gotten logged out. Okay. Three, five. To, three, okay. five, huh? And I'm on the slay the psycho nut. Okay. Slay the You're, what? Slay the, slay the psycho nut. Slay the psycho nut. That's just a, that's just a frightening kind of, um, that's just kind of a, that's just kind of a weird, um, Good news is Slay, S-L-A-Y. I was thinking Christmas, I'm sorry. There it is. 
Did I just see though that um, here it is? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm. I'm not. It's not a buy again for me. It's a three five. Oh, a couple of three fives. That's a that's, okay. a that's a that's a brewery like. I think something just popped up here a minute ago. We got some kind of badge or something that just said something about your one of your favorite places, Matthew. Some kind of invite to to uh, what's um, Wrecking Bar? Wrecking Bar is having some kind of win. I oh, know. I got it. We'll go. We'll go that. We'll go there after all. If anybody's in Atlanta, go to Wrecking Bar to eat. It's the best place to eat in town. So it's great. It's my uh, it's my weekend place. Laura and I go all the time. Looks like they maybe so, have some kind of you know some kind of you know beer festival. If that's the case, we're gonna go. So so uh, if uh, if you are joining us on our new podcast uh, venue, like uh, if you're listening to us, uh, well, thank you for for doing that. Thank you for downloading. Definitely uh, tell your friends, and uh, if you'd like to be a guest, please uh, please give us a shout. We'd love to have you on the podcast slash YouTube channel now that we're. Uh, in both formats so on real quick matthew look here it is wrecking bars eighth annual strong beer festival i mean this was built for you matthew saturday december 4th oh i mean all right we'll go in there and we'll just go right to the um falcons tampa bay game the next day oh that's gonna be brutal what a day what a day what a weekend uh, what a weekend cool cheers everybody thanks for listening drop us a comment let us know what's up we'll see you next time Cheers.